our DIY engineering. This is Jim Jim coming to you. So we had a little video issue in the beginning of this recording, so I have to bring in a new front end. Um, what we're doing this week, and we're going to turn this into a series, is we're going to start talking with Mark and Rappahannock River Fishing Report, and we're going to really talk about a lot of fishing topics. So here we go. Ah, uh, the whole first part of the interview is blank with no sound. <laughs> That's hot. Hey, that was 100% me. Technical uh, difficulties. Technical difficulties. Wow, so we just practiced this. Sorry. Yeah, that was our practice run, <laughs> our first 15-minute practice run. Thanks for staring at us the whole time. Hey, Greg. Hey, I appreciate thanks for, it. Thanks for giving us the heads up. <laughs> yeah, Greg. Oh, um, man. I'm glad you were the uh, first one to step up and let us know. Exactly. Um, yeah, that could have been a long night. Yeah, and uh, Mark might shot me and... Uh, Made me the next fish. That means bait. we ain't recording none of it either. Uh, oh, man. Uh, sorry about that, guys. All right, so it was three questions. I'm going to ask Mark again. We'll go back through them again. Yeah. No problem. So so the first question I asked Mark was... <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, the first question I asked Mark was about his page and, you know, how did he create and why did he want to create the page for Rappahannock River Fishing Report? Uh I started the, the report in, I want to say, May of 2017, because after researching online for I don't know how long, I couldn't find any up-to-date, current, valuable information that could be used to help better um, locate fish, target fish, target a certain species. Um, a lot of the data that, we, that I could find was either like two weeks old or um, say the DJIF would do a report and they would process it and then that would be two weeks you know, before they posted that report. So either the bite had shifted or uh, gone deeper or you know, pushed up the river or down the river um, you know, in a flood or something when we had 36 floods last year, 66 inches of rain. Um, but that was one of the main reasons why. Not only that, but I wanted a strong healthy community of fishermen and people that wanted to learn how to fish and between commercial and uh, recreational and charter guys I wanted us all to be able to communicate without withholding any kind of information so that we could all benefit from it that's the main goal is I wanted to I wanted to get people out on fish to have fun so they enjoyed it as much as I did um, so the second question I was uh, I pretty much asked um, was actually before I get there let me ask a question so do you all get too many questions or do you ever get questions from uh, w whether it's Virginia Marine Resource or Inland Game and Fisheries have they ever come to you asked you questions or um, the only time I've been asked questions by any of the governing um, uh, that any of the government that that governs over the bodies of water around here is when I'm on the water. Mm -hmm. I know that they're in the page and I want them in the page because mm -hmm. they're just as valuable as, as we are. Um, they're out on the water and they see it just as much as we do or if there's any emergency or if there's any kind of issue, we can all communicate with each other to try to maybe help locate somebody that's gone missing or hasn't returned back. Mm -hmm. You know, all that stuff comes into a factor. It's not just about having them there to watch people that make sure they're not catching legal fish and all that stuff. You know, I never recommend posting up illegal fish. And if it is, and you're not aware of the law, we will, we will let you know of what the law is to try to help you to understand. Yeah. FYI, Mark, uh, <laughs> he did check me up last week and, uh, um, I have to admit, I've cobia fish without a cobia permit. Um, I did not know about the cobia permit, <laughs> and uh, luckily I had Mark on board, and he sent me straight. Um, I recommend anybody listen on this. <laughs> yes, please just get it. Just get it's it. It's free. It, you can't, yeah. it, the whole purpose of the cobia um, uh, permit is so that it's a mandatory reporting, and that reporting directly correlates with the size of the fish we get to catch next year. So, and all that data comes into play on what size of the fish we get to keep next year. But it's a free permit. The only reason why they do it is because they want the mandatory reporting so they can watch the stock assessment, see how much money is spent on the fishery, um, and then go from there to see how they can either better improve it or uh, increase the longevity of the fish species by making a longer fish to catch, you know, okay. older fish to catch. Okay. 
Um, don't get caught without it. Yeah, and just real quickly, how to get there. If you go to the um, Marine Resources website, click on Recreation, go down to all the sizes where it shows all the fishes and what size they have to be and what their citations are. Down in the Cobia section, you'll see very small, fine print. <laughs> yes. It says click here, and the actual here is the link. Uh, not the click, it just the here. So um, I had a struggled with that on my phone because it's very small print. Yeah. But once you click there, it's really easy. It takes literally three minutes. Yep, as long as you've got an account set up. And then yeah. uh, now another thing is, is when the season closes, I believe it's September 31st, or the end of September, they usually give you 21 day window to report in. And if you don't report, you will not get another permit next year. They're kind of loosey goosey on the twenty one day because mm -hmm. I reported like March of this year, so mm. <laughs> it's a little bit longer than twenty one days later. Sure, but as long as it's done before, I think as long as it's done before season starts, mm -hmm. they're cool with it. Yeah, and, and you know, honestly, I don't mind reporting that. I think it's a, no. I think it's a good thing for everybody because to see the statistics at the end of the year where yeah. the fish population. You get to growing. see how much the commercial guys are fishing on, yeah. the charter guys are spending money on. They they put out all the information for us as anglers to get mm -hmm. to view it. And we can make our own, and they'll tell you, I believe they'll even tell you the best baits. It'll tell you what worked the most. Mm -hmm. It told you the average size of the commercial guys catch, the average size of the recreational guys catch, and they'll have a two different size limit as well because of that. But That sounds like another show, Mark. <laughs> another show. We go into depth on that one, yeah. just, on, just on permits. Yeah, yeah I mean, no, well, I mean, just if they pulling that report up and looking at oh, it. Oh, man, that would really be good. Great. You know, same thing with for the stock sure. assessment for herring, which is, you know, the moratorium on herring except for mm -hmm. hickory shad. Yeah, maybe we could do a whole show. I know some people are not going to want to hear about reports, but I think there's some people out there that may want to hear that stuff kind of I really pulled think that, apart. Yeah, the diehard you know? people that really yeah. spend more than... 20 hours a month on it, mm. I think we'll pay attention because it can change their whole aspect on fishing because of that report. Okay. All right. So one last question and we'll get into some of the better stuff where everybody's actually probably toned in. I don't yeah. want to, I don't want to keep everybody too long. So the one last question, um, you know, it, it was, is about expansion of the, um, Rappahannock river fishing report into other reports. Um, you know, what do you think about that in the future? Or are you going to always try to just keep it all in Rappahannock or do you think you're going to do a Chesapeake uh, Rappahannock uh, you know I mean or is it going to turn into something like a Virginia a G Virginia Waters report you know? you know it might be a Virginia Waters report or it might be a Virginia title report mm -hmm. maybe I think that would probably be the better route would do a title report because you do a Virginia Waters report and you're going to get every large mouth and crappy caught in every guy's backyard pond that, which I true. appreciate but yeah. if we're trying to directly um yeah, not everybody's going to fish in his pond. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You know, I you can't know. say that, oh, we yeah. can go take rattle traps over to Billy's house and try to get something, <laughs> yeah. but we ca because we can't. We don't have the permission to I don't to think Billy there. would like your 5,500 uh, no. <laughs> uh, followers on your page showing up in his yeah. backyard. Hey, Mark oh, yeah, said fish are yeah, biting come in this on by. Yep. Yep. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I think, you know, maybe starting a Virginia Tidal Waters report mm -hmm. um, just to cover the bay and what areas tributaries come off of it every every which way possible um would probably be one of the most valid tools in the bay that you could use after it was established probably within two or three years if you could get all the charter guys involved and everybody involved and if we can get how we've got the the rat page going if we can get the chesapeake page going anywhere near like that mm-hmm a lot of people are going to catch a lot more fish and have a lot more mm -hmm. fun. There's going to be a lot more respect for the water. That's another big thing, too, is there's – our group is – we've gotten a lot more respect for the water. A lot of people mm -hmm. will automatically clean up after themselves. I mean, we got the rule. You pack it in, you pack it out. But on boats, we got to – every time we go out, we always pull one or two pieces of trash with us, take with us every mm -hmm. single time. Every single time. It's just – it's worth it if we're in an area and, you know, not big trash. I mean, we pulled a gas can out. I think it was an orange – traffic cone we pulled out um we haven't touched it yet but there was a broken porta potty south of hop yard <laughs> you know there's a whole bunch of stuff that's was that traffic cone from the uh channel marker of uh Gwen's island <laughs> I, I don't know this one this was the big barrel oh, the i don't know how barrel. that got in there wow but we always try to get some trash out of the river to clean up a little bit there's already enough issues that it mm. has minus people putting trash in it like pollution runoff from the farms um, and when they blew the dam uh, in Fredericksburg and uh, completely took out the whole silt barrier for the river. That's why we lost 13 to 15 feet of water depth at City Docks in five mm -hmm. years. 
So when just this is my stupidity, but I don't know too much about that. Damn, when was it blown? I want I. It, I'm, don't quote me, but I want to say it was 2012. Oh, so, wow. so it's been recent. It's recent. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Six years ago. So um, the word on the streets is they figured out that if they blew the dam, the herring could go up further to spawn and have a wider spawning ground for them in such a small concentrated mm-hmm. area, which would be Route 1 to the dam. Okay. Um, and that's such a small area. So they blew the dam. Um, and I believe it was either last year or year before did a six acre shock all to see what has traveled further mm-hmm. there during the shad run. I believe I'm not hundred percent sure, but I want to say that the only thing that they was new above that dam was channel cats. There's been no other signs of those herring moving up that further. Mm-hmm. And because of last year's floods and all that rain, all of the original spawning holes after they blew the dam are now completely full. full. Yeah. So you've got an issue of where you've destroyed the only spawning ground because of the silt. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe it wouldn't have been as bad without if it didn't have so many floods last year, but the correlation before that, we've lost 12 feet of water depth at City Docks before all those floods last year. Mm. You know, there was a riverboat that came there for 25, 30 years, and it ran aground twice, had to give the money back twice, so they left out of here because they lost the water depth. Mm. I mean, it was literally like 18 feet at, at high tide, and it's three. Wow. At low tide, people would go out and get their lures back off of stuff because you could go out and get them. Wow, wow. That's what, you know, and that just shows you, now, I can't, you can't blame anybody for this. You don't know how the, you know the environment's going to adapt. You don't know how it's going to change when you do that. All I know is those herring were, have been programmed for the last 250 years mm-hmm. to turn around at that dam. So it's going to take another 10, 15 years before they realize, oh, crap, I can reach past that dam. But it's it's in their, it's built into their GPS sure, 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 yeah. to turn around. You know, And yeah. that, that is passed down to the next gene. Hey, turn around right here, buddy. Yeah. We don't go up any further. Just turn around. But now that area in between there is now destroyed. You know, it's just, that's one of the things that we have to deal with. Now, I have been talking with a committee, uh, a member of this committee that's, that meets um, on the weekend about a uh, dredge plan enacted and a possible new silt barrier being installed. <clears throat> My recommendation was they have the new bridge coming across 95 uh, for Easy Pass was to build the silt barrier inside the footings of the mm-hmm. Easy Pass bridge and put the easement to the Easy Pass so that it doesn't cost taxpayers money comes out of the easy pass that was my suggestion <laughs> we'll see how that goes i'm pretty sure the plan's already drawn up and the footage already done so they have to re-engineer everything and that might not work but if another silt wall slash barrier is not in place that river is going to get more and more destroyed as time goes on i think it's it's going to become less and less fishable less and less swimmable well actually i know a person that's going to be hit of that bridge like they're the head mechanical company and I, I might put you in it sounds like you should be on the team of like board of representatives for that bridge, i mean it's, but, it's an option yeah. you know but, it, it yeah, seems like I mean, one of the better options that wouldn't sure. cost a bunch of people money mm-hmm. but we'd still achieve the same goal i've even said if they don't want to do it i'll get 60 people off the page and we'll go and make an old school rock dam from yeah. river rock Shoot, just I'm something in. just something mm-hmm. three four feet high that'll slow it down break the silt up and we'll put fish ladders on each side so yeah. the fish can travel up if need be that's what they should have done in the first place mm-hmm. is literally just taken out a 15 foot section on each side right. and built fish ladders up like every other dam in america mm-hmm. you know just the little steps so they could go up and that would actually probably turn into a spawning hole too the inside of those ladders right um you know they have shad cams on the james because there's fish ladders on the side so you can see the shad when the shad run through you can literally swing by they, just, yeah. they dart right on by and it's a live feed camera huh. yeah that might that may, might be a good thing to show on one of the episodes as well maybe we'll bring it up oh yeah all right so let's um we we've uh we really talked a little bit about the page um there's a lot more questions that i'd like to ask we'll save that up for another um thing but let's get into what everybody came here for and let's start talking about where or excuse me uh, yes, where and what fish you're gonna catch at each location, um, and let's let's focus from Port Royal to the Whitestone Bridge for tonight, um, and I'm gonna kind of leave it up to you. I may ask you a few questions here and there. Um, 
I'm a Whitestone Bridge Fort guy. I don't know anything past the Whitestone. I think I can count on my hands how many times I've passed that bridge. I think probably Whitestone <laughs> to the bay, that small section, I think I've fished probably six times. <laughs> but the area in between Port Royal and, and Whitestone, I've fished pretty heavy. We What we'll probably start with is Tappahannock because that's the easiest okay. accessible, um, the best open public place to fish. Okay. Um, we can talk about bridge etiquette mm-hmm. so that people don't get hurt because people are hauling butt through, not the main channel, through just sections of the bridge while people are anchored up on the backside. Yeah, and if you know of any shoals, you know, or anything like yeah. that that people should stay away from or hidden stuff um, in any of these holes... Yeah, uh, if you would let us know. We'll probably talk too. about what we'll do is we'll go ahead and scroll in and get up on um, probably the tap bridge, and we'll talk about that small area inside that bridge. We'll show where you can launch, where you can't, um, what you got to dodge, what you can come out and get. Um, in this area, right next to... Well, first of all, you're going to come out of Hodgkins Creek. If you're going to launch, you got two options. You got June Parker up at the top, um, which is a great marina. Those guys are real nice. Nathan Parker is a real nice guy. Do they have fuel there? What's that? Do they have fuel? At that I marina? believe I I I'm not 100 percent sure, but I believe there's a fuel tank there okay. to refuel. Yes, and I think it's a ten dollar launch drop box. Mm. Um, launch any point in time uh they'll sometimes there might be cones in the way but n- normally he'll move them out of the way but you can launch there and come out what, what is, size boats normally um probably anything up to you know 20 22 foot it's got a but is it so it's good enough for kayak so too you can yeah you can it. soft launch if you want see but i wouldn't i i'd recommend that for a big launch big boat launch because you got a boats, yeah, yeah big your big trailer boats because then you could come down here and um, right next to the bridge, literally right next to the bridge is a... Where's the bridge at? Let me zoom back out. Where's the bridge? There it is. All right. So literally right next to the bridge where these broken pylons are, that's the old pier. Yeah. 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 So that's the old pier um, coming out as long as they... You know. Yeah, they can see your mouth. All right, so the, the long pier coming out, but right here on Prince Street, there's a uh, concrete old school ramp that's a great kayak soft launch because what will happen is is you can launch there, but you don't hit hard current until you come out to about the end of the broken pylons, and that's when the drop off the ledge of the, the channel starts. So you can actually work the area from the broken pylons into the channel without having to jockey too much while you're paddling on a kayak or, Mm -hmm. you know, if you don't have a pedal kayak or something like that, you can actually jig those pylons for rockfish and get cats. Usually late summer now because of how much fresh water is in here, your croaker, your spot will be up in there too, your white perch and all that. And your main channel, believe it or not, the deepest part right here doesn't hold crap. I've never, I've never pulled anything bigger than six or eight pounds catfish wise out of the center. Mm-hmm. Um, Do most, you normally pull them on the drop off or on the shallow no, side? No, so we go over to the shallow side. We literally. Um, Is that muddy bottom around this? Yeah, bottom? it's all silt mud. Yeah. It's literally like black silt mm-hmm. mud bottom that, okay. that's there. So you can see it when you pull your anchor up, you got to yeah. clean it off, and it's that nasty crud. Um, I've got pictures of. It smells um, great. Yeah, I've also got pictures <laughs> of uh, runoff so thick and pulled together on the current seam. That the runoff on the bottom was wet, the top was dry like powder. You could pick it up and shake it off. Wow. It was so condensed, all the runoff from the fields. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's a lot of stuff that comes through there. The current can rip through there on a coefficient above like 85. Um, the current, you know, 85 to 105 will really rip through that place. Uh, me and David were fishing at one time, and a current a coefficient of 105, the current was probably doing four and a half, five miles an hour. <laughs> And we, on the first anchor, we hooked three fish over 50 pounds and not, didn't get not one of them, or we got two, uh, got one of them out, but not two of them. We couldn't get past the pylons of the bridge because they had just opened their mouth, turned to a drift sock, and they broke 65 pound power pro like it was nothing. Mm. Snapped it like twine. We got one at the back of the boat and he broke the hook. So that was within the first 12 minutes of the first anchor mm. on a hard current. That's, a, um, if, Right here where the channel edge ends, the usually the channel marker is right here in the main channel. 
Um, if you're out there, there's actually a cool little thing. There's a uh, peregrine falcon sanctuary on the scaffolding that comes down and goes down to the main channel pylons. Mm-hmm. It's a dog kennel, and they actually have babies, and it's a little sanctuary so that they can, you know, a little habitat for Yeah, them. yeah, yeah. Um, a lot of ospreys there. Late summer, fall, you'll see pelicans there, um, cormorant. Sometimes the bluefish will roll up in there. <clears throat> it all depends on what the salinity is of the water mm-hmm. at that point in time, which we've been doing pretty good this year on rain, and it's starting to pick back up, but we're still, I want to say, a solid four or five points below what the average is, which you can literally go out at Tappahannock and not smell it or mm-hmm. taste it when in previous years. Last year, May, we caught stingray there. You know, mm-hmm. so it's just, it all depends on how hard the salinity pushes back up, how much rain we get mm-hmm. and all that. That'll dictate how the migratory species will get up there. Great rock fishing spot. Mm-hmm. No deeper. We've caught all of our fish up to 33 inches, almost when, 34 inches in like 12 feet of water. When do you think the rockfish come in there the best? I mean, what's, what's you know, everybody has. Springtime. Time. See, springtime, they're on the spawn mission. Mm-hmm. You know, they're like, let's haul butt up there. Let's get there as fast as possible. We're going to wait for the water to heat up just a little bit. Then we'll spawn. Then we're going to run back out fast as possible. So springtime, usually from your Port Royal up, is a little bit better rock fishing area because it gets nice and condensed and you can find some, you know, Believe it or not, some of the guys catch 40-plus-inch rocks on flies and shad darts right before Route 1 bridge while they're wading in the water. <laughs> you know, they'll catch them, lift them up, take a picture, put them right back in the water and go on mm-hmm. and catch them on a, you know, 8-pound tippet or something put, like that. Yeah. yeah. So, but usually the fall run, that is the bee's knees. You can go to that bridge and limit out within an hour. And, and when you say fall, is that like November, October? October, I think I want to say the season starts October 4th, or 6th. Yeah, yeah. So the second week in October. Something like that. Yeah. And... You got to figure out, and this is where the whole thing of being able to post different waters on this page. That's Mm -hmm. the biggest case in point right there because you will watch and see when they come in and they're catching them in Lynn Haven. Mm -hmm. Then you'll see them catch them at the tunnel. Then you'll see them catch them off of Buck Row. Then you'll see them catch them off of Gloucester Point. So you can see the migration as it's happening. So then you will have a general idea the charter guys will probably start hitting them late October, right at the mouth, mm-hmm. um, decent size. And then once that all depends on the temperature of the outside air at sure, that point sure. in time. As soon as it starts dropping fast, they're gonna kick on like gangbusters. You can fish them all the way down to about forty degree, thirty nine and a half degree water, and they shut off. They won't hit up here for some reason uh, at, at that low water temp. But as mm-hmm. long as it's anywhere from sixty five, between sixty five and forty, usually the magic number's right around fifty. Mm-hmm. And they'll burn up anything. Okay. Because they're not here to spawn. They're, you know, it's kind of like a false spawn. They come in and they, and they just feed on a bunch of stuff and turn around and go back. So while we're on rockfish, um, and you don't have to pull it out or anything, but what's your favorite bait? Is it live bait, artificial bait? What's the lure that you like? So it all depends where we're going. It all depends on what location. For instance, Tappahannock at the bridge. Um, we troll. Let's see. I might have some. Hold on one sec. I'll tell you. I'll show you the the, uh, the beginning and the middle and the end of what we normally start with and what we finish out with. So to start the season off, we go with the blue and chrome or black and chrome rattle trap, the big saltwater. That one, if you control that, and I'll explain the trolling tactic on the bridge in a minute after we go through this other bait. Um, oh, and if you can get the big version of the uh, white, the white with the red head, that's your murky water, your dirty water. That, that'll that catch fish in any dirty water right there. Um, so that's what we start out with in October going into November. And then once the feed bag really kicks on when the water temp drops. Are, are the baits the uh, same thing like catching uh, Max where you do bright day, bright bait? Yep, um, dark day, dark color, bright day, yeah. bright color. Yep. Yep, and then we'll go to this guy. This was our number one producer in the fall of 2017. It's a three-ounce cannonball jig with a six-inch white curly tail grub on it. I didn't bring it with me, but we'll spray these down with Menhaden. Okay. Menhaden spray, Jack's Juice Menhaden spray. You can get it at Bass Pro, most of these places online. Anywhere from six to ten bucks. It was so good. That year, mm-hmm. you couldn't find a can within a, a hundred miles, nor could you order it from the factory because you could place the order and they wouldn't be able to tell you when it was going to ship. 
Would Would you be interested in ever trying to figure out how to make your own, or or actually start dabbling on making your own? Eventually, if I, I'm such a multi-species person that, and I'm ADHD, so I can't focus on one <laughs> fish, so I want to catch them all. Sure, I, sure. I, you know, you see when we yeah. go out, it's like, oh, let's make it a grab bag. Yeah. We're in this area. We know these fish are in this area. Let's get every single one of them if we can. Yep, uh, uh, same I'm, way. <laughs> that's how I roll. That's how I want to fish. I don't ever limit myself to one species unless that is the only species you can literally fish for when you go out. Right. You know, catfish early, or, early um, January, February. You know, I've already gotten a bunch of citations this year. My first one was like January 6th this year. Nice. Yeah. And that's, you know, catfish, they'll eat. That's when they turn the feed bag on. It's like January through March. <laughs> you could throw a whole, like, two-pound gizzard shed at them, and they'll still burn it up. So, uh, is is this same spot your catfish spot, too? So, yeah. So, funny story is, the biggest catfish I've caught in the wrap, I caught trolling for rockfish. <laughs> And all it was was that white curly tail six inch grub on an unpainted Z Man two ounce jig head sprayed with uh, menhaden oil. And I ran it literally. So when we troll, say uh, that's the bridge, you're going to want to go uh, parallel to the bridge. And you're going to want to start, we're going to say um, the current's coming from Fredericksburg going to the bay. And what we're going to do is, is we're going to start. On the Fredericksburg side, so that your baits will be pulled by the current up underneath the bridge. What you'll do is you'll run parallel to the bridge and let the baits swoop back behind the pylons. Uh, the pile, the rockfish will like to sit up on top of the pylons as close to the pylons as possible and ambush baits as they go by. Um, the only thing is, is there's no speed to it. You go f- as fast enough to keep you off the bridge. That's all it is. If you go any faster, they'll, they might not catch it. You might not get into the strike zone. And if you're not snagging, you're not in them. You can be 10, 8 feet off the bridge and hit a rando, but you can be right up against the bridge and catch 40 of them on one pass. You know. So do you go perpendicular to current, or do you ever try to rod with the current? If we are big trolling, um, no structure like a bridge, mm-hmm. uh, open water, always with current, or... Mm-hmm perpendicular to the current mm-hmm. never against you'll mm-hmm. never have a bait pool a bait pod run against the current because mm-hmm. the it'll out it'll you know it's basically a small fish trying to run a marathon constantly all day long it ain't gonna happen they're gonna run mm-hmm. out of energy mm-hmm. eventually they're gonna get pushed down in the current mm-hmm. um but you want to troll with the current um and your trolling speed will dictate by what uh, temperature of the water mm-hmm. So the higher the temperature, the faster the speed. The lower the temperature, the slower the speed. All okay. the way down to like 1.25 miles an hour. Okay. Roughly. And and the guys that are running paddle boats uh, or, or ca- paddle kayaks or paddle kay- or just paddling a kayak, what do you recommend them to do for rockfish? Because trolling is a little bit more difficult with those. Set up on the bridge. Um, so at slack tide on the bridge... I've done it in my little boat because I can. I've literally, when the water is no current, you can drive underneath the bridge long ways for four pylons, go back out and go back in again. Mm -hmm. So what we'll do is we'll do that at slack tide to mark the ditch inside the pylons where the pylons are stacked up. The ditch will be right inside the center and we'll see what's down below us. Mm -hmm. So we know when the current flips, we know which pylons to set up on to get the biggest fish. And, you know, say it's coming from the bay, coming back in, but it's dead slack now, but we know it's getting ready to start coming back in. We'll mark fish and then say, oh, well, these three have fish on them. We'll go out here, park an anchor, and right, pluck them right it. back off. You can do it with cut bait. You can do it with live bait. If you come out of Hodgkins Creek, um, so when you come out of Hodgkins, usually for the past couple of years, other than, you know, the flood year or whatever, you can come out and literally as soon as you put the boat in in Hodgkins, Where's the boat ramp? There, there's the bridge. I'm assuming the boat ramp's about right here. Yeah. All right, so when you come out, there'll be a barge right over here. And this whole big open area is all dredged because they put a barge through here, so it's 12 feet deep through the hmm. whole channel because they dredged the whole creek to get the barge in there. You'll you, How you'll know there's bait there is because there's a big stand right here with a light on it, big flashing light, and there's ospreys and all that stuff. But you'll see bunker and everything popping and uh, perch. Uh, creek chubs, rain minnows, uh, all be popping in there, and you can go over there, and as soon as you put in, go to the right, start cast netting. Get all your live baits, take all your live baits, go out to the bridge, 
and start throwing them out on either modified knock rigs or throw them out on three-way rigs and keep them up off the bottom if you want rocks. Number mm -hmm. one thing about fishing for rocks with cut bait or live bait, get it off the bottom because the, the cats will burn it up. Uh, usually we fish on a three-way, about two feet up off the bottom, um, eight-ounce sinker out to a 10-inch uh, leader to like a four-aught circle hook or five-aught circle hook, and you put something live on there. Okay. Yeah, and that'll pin down to the current, and it'll hold in the current once the current starts kicking on. You can't float baits. You can throw a knock rig out with probably like a three or four-ounce, but it's going to bounce literally from pylon to pylon inside as the current goes. <laughs> yeah. As the fish tries to swim, it'll roll sure, it from sure. side to side, but it'll look injured, and something will snatch it up. All right. So, um, what, what else, um, what other spots would you like to show us, um, today? So we can go since, you know, everybody pretty much knows the, the bridge here. So this is stay, pretty much stay away from the north side of the bridge. I mean, you, this is the super shallow spot is all the way at the top. Like you're going into Calio over there and mm -hmm. it's like, uh, the pylons are numbered. I want to say where the broken pylons start next to the soft launch on the on the south side of the channel, it's like 25. And then where it goes all the way across to the Calio side, it's like 80 something or 85 is where it's the shallowest. But you see, you got a dimple in the center. You got a, a, an up a and then it goes down. Yeah. You got a dimple right there. That dimple holds a lot of fish, even away from the bridge. Not a lot of people know that. That's just a little side spot, has a little bit of current. Um, that will hold fish off the bridge. And if you can park two, 300 yards off the bridge in that little dimple, and uh, it's usually, I think it's around like pylon 50 or 45 or something like that, straight back towards Fredericksburg, there's a nice dimple right there. Okay. And you can fish that area and see, you got another one right here. You got that area as well too, but the one thing that about this, where the about that bridge where the rockfish stack up on, they follow current. So as the current picks up and speeds up, It'll change speeds at different locations on the bridge. You know, as it starts up, well, we figured out on the end tide, the uh, coming in from the bay, it'll start down here, will be the, the where the current starts, and then it'll start pushing up the bridge. So once it starts pushing up the bridge, you can literally find the current right current speed, mm -hmm. and they'll stick in that current speed as it moves up and down the bridge. So you, it's pretty much pretty. Most of the time, it starts in the uh, deeper water and then kind of pushes back. On the in tide. Yeah, on the in tide. As soon as it flips on the outside, it starts at the Calio side, getting fast, and then it works its way back out to the deep side, so it's like an opposite. You know, you got the in tide will start down at the bottom, and the out tide will start at the top, and that's where the current on the bridge will start. Okay. And you can usually find something within that current um, where it starts to about, about 10 or 15 pylons over where it starts picking up. That's probably about where the fish are going to be at. Okay. Yeah, there's... um. If we go to another spot, let's go, uh, ch -ch 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 -ch, where do we want to go up? Let's see, we can go to Wilmot. So you go up to Wilmot Boat Ramp, you can launch a trailer there, it's a real small ramp, <laughs> real small landing, but if you are looking for a cold water holding spot for every fish in the river, mm -hmm. your boat ramp will be down here-ish. Roughly, roughly at the, uh, roughly at the the bot the middle right above this little green area, and then you're gonna want to put in and go south like you're going towards Tappahannock, and you can see already see the bend and how deep it is. So when the water temp drops below 40 degrees and you start hunting for fish, wow, it's 60 foot deep there. Exactly. So they'll hit the thermocline inside this this bend right here. Mm. I can show you fish finder picks from one trip where we marked pods of perch, uh, stacks of crappie up against the first wall where you launch at, catfish over 60 pounds, uh, missed rockfish, and rockfish up to 40 inches. Hmm. All holding in this one bend in January. And that the only reason why we fish there is because it's got a 50 foot. If you notice on any part in the river where you see the deepest hole, more than likely there's a cliff attached to the face of it mm -hmm. because that usually means that insinuates where the hardest current comes through mm -hmm. because it wears out the deepest hole. Right, right. So this has got a 50-foot cliff yeah. face on the, yeah. the whole thing. So we had a, a north 25-mile-an-hour yeah. wind coming down on us, and that was the only place we could hide. We literally put in and went over, and it was dead flat calm, and the wind was blowing over top of us. <laughs> that was the only place we could duck and cover and go fishing that day. That, and that spot will hold a bunch of fish. And, uh, I mean, we can always go on the, the, the good old snakehead debate, and just that's just pick any creek with, <laughs> with, 
lilies and grass. And what I like to do is I like to go on Google Maps and look for black water inside the creek. You will literally see the current seam of brown water coming out. And wherever mm -hmm. you see the black water on the side, 90% of the time you'll see lilies attached to the side. And the grass will be right there. Usually those black waters will produce what will hold decent snakehead. And with the rains last year and the low salinity in the water... The snakehead have moved all the way to the bay. They're getting them in crab pots in the bay out of the mouth. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we have some. Uh, last year, it was the first time I've actually ever seen one person. I started freaking out because I saw a stick moving at the end of the <laughs> creek. And, I mean, this stick, though, wasn't little. It yeah, was let's, like, we'll let know. them know that he's, we're right next to Deltaville. Yeah, so I, I'm, I'm at, literally, we're literally like five minutes from the mouth. And he's <laughs> got a creek right back here that he's seen snakehead in. Yeah. You know, and that's that's just goes to show you how far they have spread you know and the reproduction rate's ridiculous mm. i honestly think wholeheartedly within the next two years you are going to see an explosion of snakehead fishing like you've never seen on any other river mm. you know where i think that they're just that's gonna, gonna be the new trophy fish i think so you know for fresh water for fresh water and you know that'll be another debate of switching um non-native fish over to game fish mm -hmm. i think there should be a 30-year rule that if it's been here 30 years it's a native yeah you know what i'm saying where they what do they say it's a to homestead you got to be somewhere for 25 years yeah you know so that makes you a native you could have came from canada it doesn't matter what you can homestead after 25 years i think the same thing is you know uh, uh, with these fish as well mm -hmm. and catfish and all that you know the catfish industry has completely changed usda now approves every blue catfish that get goes out for re resale and that's the only what go, what meat governing body do you know of that monitors a fish <laughs> you know they're starting yeah. to do 25 dollar plate dinners up in annapolis they're really trying to pump it yeah. so that there's a good market for it but i think for snakehead or for catfish for catfish and okay. snakehead oh wow so i heard it was 20 dollars a pound at um the market uh, the wharf up in dc you wow. can buy it right off the wharf right there. And it's a delicacy. A lot of uh, four-star, five-star restaurants start making meals out of $50 mm -hmm. meals out of Snakehead because of how good the meat is. I personally mm -hmm. have never eaten it. I've seen it cut open, and it looks like chicken breast. It does not look like fish. It looks like straight-up meat. Like, <laughs> like seriously, <laughs> like meat. It, it looks, and you can tell because that fish is a very strong fish. Okay. One of the smartest fish I've ever fished for, by far. Have you heard of any kind of like uh, worms or diseases that were in the fish? In the snakehead, no, but in blue cats, your highest concentration of mercury, um, we recommend never to eat anything over 15 pounds. Never. As we, and the reason why is because those fish eat fish. Mm. Each fish has mercury in it. That mercury translates from the smaller fish into the bigger fish into its fat cells. You eat the fat. You, you just basically dose yourself with mercury. Mm -hmm. So we recommend anything 15 pounds and under, eat that, and we save the trophy fish, you know, roughly around 20 pounds and up. Um, because what will happen is just like as we get older, we'll have fat on us that we can't lose. Mm -hmm. They do the same thing. They'll have fat on them that they can't wear off in the summertime, and that fat will hold all the mercury in it. So it, it just keeps stacking up and stacking up and stacking up. That's okay. why there's a recommendation for how much you should eat off the river. Mm -hmm. Eight ounces of fish a month. Sure, or, sure. The same food. things in the bay yeah, yeah. as well. Yeah, and that's because the PCBs, because, you know, Potomac's got like five power plants or four power yeah. plants on it. Luckily, we don't have any power physical power plants. We used to. Um, the one up in Old Town or in downtown Fredericksburg, but it's the runoff. Mm -hmm. You know, the fertilizer, pesticide runoff that you can literally smell and see floating on the water. It looks like the brown bubbles you would see at the beach when it all foams up on the beach. <laughs> That's what it looks like coming down the river. Sure, sure. And then it'll dry up and turn into look looks like sand. Hmm. Yeah. All right. Is there any other spots up near Port Royal um, maybe that you want to tap on? Um, we've been on for about 50 minutes. Yeah, um, I mean, there's, you know... We can go north of Port Royal and we'll go hit Hicks, which is a great bunch of people, man. They got a great boat landing. A lot of bass tournaments go out of there. Fredericksburg Fishing Club goes out of there. Um, we do Rappahannock River Blues tournaments that are out of there for catfish. Hey, guys, if y'all want to comment, throw us a question. Uh, now's the time to do it. Um, we've got 11 viewers on right now. Um, we've had 26 different viewers, so... 
Go ahead and send us a comment. Ask us questions. Yeah, we're open um, for anything. I mean, we could spend ten hours trying to hit. I mean, show. We've every got a list spot. of topics that we yeah. haven't even touched yet. Yeah, we're. It's gonna yeah. have. This is gonna have to be a multi episode yeah. thing. I, I have a feeling this is gonna turn into a. Um, uh, a series. A series, yeah. Yes. We'll, go, we'll go with a web series. Yeah. Um, what we can do is we can talk about, um, let's see what's hot right now. This we got, We're got. we going into Snakehead. We're coming out of uh, Striped Bass. Uh, that season ends in the 15th. Let, let's, I mean, to be honest, I'm a very Snakehead illiterate person. I, tell us tell us some baits. We were talking about it. Tell us some of your favorite baits. Um, I've only started fishing for them this year. I literally targeted them six times last year because... Once it started flooding, mm-hmm. we took 60 trips to Hampton from Fredericksburg. You know, that's like, that's a lot of driving, you know. Yeah. That's a lot of driving, but that's where the fish were. Mm-hmm. That we went to the fish. People got to understand sometimes you got to go to the fish. You know, it just works out that way. You can always sit and post up and let them come by you and wait, wait, wait. Or you can go to them and really get into them. Mm-hmm. You know, it all depends on how really bad you want it. You know, I, I have a, a saying of there's a three different type of fishermen. There's the, I'm just here to have fun. Or I just do it on the weekend, or it's this is all I do, mm-hmm. you know, which is fine. All three of them are fine, but you know, it's got to you got to. You're out. all three of them, Mark. I'm not. I'm, <laughs> I'm the fr- I'm the last one. I'm the, I'm the guy that fishes 50 hours a week. Yeah. You know, puts the water time in yeah. so that we can get a nice report. And I do it just just for the people. You know, people want to be negative about it and all that stuff, or think that I'm boasting. But you got to understand. A lot of these people seriously use this information to save money, save fuel, buy the right baits. You go to the right areas, fish in the right areas. And I want to say I'm probably at like a 70, 75% catch ratio for other people, <laughs> you know, for, for getting them on other people on fish. That's all I want to do is I just want to help. It's my journey where I'm going to constantly learn. Fishing is one of those things you'll never stop learning. Sure, sure. There's so many different fish to learn, tactics, whatever. You could find an old head that fishes completely different com- from what people do today. Or you could have, find a young kid that will show you something that you ain't never thought of. <laughs> you know, it's, and that's the joy of it because it brings, doesn't matter what age, color, creed, size, uh, male, female, whatever you identify as. As long as if you fish, we all got a common goal. That, that's... So, uh, Lindsay, we're going to come back to you. Uh, we, we just briefed over Tappahannock, but I'll, I'll get him to go back over Tappahannock one more time for you. But um, we've got a question here. Never caught a snakehead. What bait, what test line, and what depth? All right. So, the rule that with, worked for you. <laughs> the rule with snakehead is if you think you're shallow, go shallower. Wow. And I mean shallow, shallow, shallow. Usually most of the fish, most of the snakeheads we've caught are a foot and a half less. Wow. Um, is it visible water or is it murky water? Okay, so that's the thing is what I've figured out this year is we always got brown water in the wrap. It's mm-hmm. just something we live with now because they blew the dam. We're always going to have silt mm-hmm. that will ride the tide, wish wash back, pick up, drop, pick up, drop, and go back and forth. So most of the creeks that come up off of here, let's see, we'll go down to Piscataway. I'll bring up Piscataway Creek because they are in there considering it is a... Um, Tidal Creek. Technically, that's the brackish area. So when you hit 360, that's your saltwater license. Right, right. So and it's south of 360, closer to your your house. Yeah. So technically, that's in saltwater. So, but we'll go up into Piscataway. So if you're catching snake snakeheads, uh, excuse my uh, ignorance again, but if you're catching snakehead in saltwater, do you have to have a freshwater license? No, you only need the license for which. The body of water you're fishing in. So it says okay. Tappahannock in South, all you need is salt water. Okay. And the, the tributary is feeding into that. I believe as long as it's attached, mm-hmm. that salt water license will work because okay. you are technically south of 360. But it's best to, if you do any kind of decent hardcore fishing or travel for it, mm-hmm. get both. You know, there, there, there's no point in going out without a license. This weekend, everybody gets to go out with a license, which is another topic. Um, we could finish out on because it's the free fishing weekend. Okay. For anybody. Remind me. We'll, we'll yeah. bring it. Yeah. So, so the question was, is like, what, what's, what type line do you use? And so bait? we, uh, line and bait for snake kid. Okay. So usually the prime baits are top water frog, either a hollow body with physical legs that mm-hmm. will, when you jerk, you'll pull once and then reel twice and pull once and reel twice. And the legs will literally go out and come back in when you stop. So mm-hmm. it looks like a motion. Then you've got a skirted frog, which usually, that was the adaptation of after the snakehead bit the legs off, you'd keep the hollow body and 
push a skirt back through it so it looked like it had two legs again. <laughs> so you would salvage a frog because frogs are anywhere from eight to fifteen bucks. Mm -hmm. And you get two bites on it and it's thrashed. And unless it goes all the way down the gullet, he's gonna burn it up and tear it up and cut the legs off, it, poke holes in it so it fills full of water and sinks. Mm. You know, or where the uh, tie on point is right at the mouth, he'll tear that all up so it won't pull straight, it'll start turning and pulling sideways. Okay. You know, all that stuff your presentation is your number one thing for snakehead. If it don't look pretty, he ain't going to hit it. He's not going to touch it, or he's either going to tap it and push it away from there as okay. a territorial strike, because mm -hmm. they're very territorial. But So your baits are topwater frog with legs, without legs, with a skirt, topwater mouse, um, weedless, if you can, because you're going to be hitting lilies, you're going to be hitting grass, everything you want to run weedless. Um, you can even do weedless paddle tails on a blade. And run, excuse me, inside the water column, as long as there's not a bunch of hydrilla ran up, or you can run the, the lily edge um, out in the open water, and you'll be able to see the lily pad drop as he darts out. Okay. You'll see the wake push down as hmm. as he comes out, which is great to see. So what what pet, um, what test line are you using? Ultralight rods, medium rods. You want something with a firm tip because this is a hard mouth fish. Okay. I literally, literally just had a buddy break a rod setting a hook. That's how hard you set it. Um, <laughs> dead serious. Watched another guy break two lures. Had um, brick rod tip and all that because you got it. It's such a hard mouth fish. It's mm. either and if you get them inside the mouth within an inch, it's like a plate all the way inside. But if it's half inch past that, you'll find a soft spot and it'll hook okay. right on up. But um, you're gonna want to go. What 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 we try to do is we try to do for targeting them for the best results, for the best conditions is what I should say, is we try to work the high tide turning to go back out. Because okay. what will happen is, is nine times out of ten, the tide will push brown water into the creek. And then once it goes to flip back out, it'll be jet clear. It looks like spring water. You'll be able to want to drink it. Mm -hmm. And that when that clears out, they will hit in murky water, don't get me wrong, but they are a site predator, a territorial predator, and instead of uh, in murky water, you have to drop the bait on top of them. Mm -hmm. In clear water, you can drop the bait three feet next to them, and they'll still see it and still come out and whap it. Okay. Yeah, and then you can sight cast them. And you, you're in such shallow water, as soon as the water clears up, and you stand up on your kayak or your boat or whatever, and you're looking down, and you'll see something black swim by, or you'll see a gar, or you'll see a catfish or whatever. That's, a lot of stuff's been holding up in the creek. But you'll see them come by, and you just pitch the frog to them, and he'll turn to it, and you'll twitch it twice and stop. And then I'll swallow it. <laughs> and you'll hear this. That's it. That's it. That's it. No splash. No splash. And you, it just opens the mouth and the frog just goes down and that's it. And then, or if it's a territorial, they'll hit it like a freight train and it'll sound like a nine mil going off. Really? Big crap. And you're like, oh, and it'll scare you. But the biggest thing is, is resisting the urge to set the hook <laughs> instantly. Yeah. Oh my gosh. It took me six trips to realize <laughs> just let them take it yeah. just let them take it um old school bow to the cow you know bow to the bow to the bow to the cow when a big yeah. fish takes it and starts running bow let them take it flip the bail pull up same kind of thing this he eats the frog it's got a double fang hook in it and it's got to go inside of his mouth the body has to drop so that the hook can set inside of his mouth. So do you ever run a leader so that you... Nope. You're... Straight to braid, 30 to 50 pound. Okay. They will bite through it. Okay. It'll happen, I want to say probably two out of 20 times, maybe three out of 20 times, where, case in point, yesterday when I was fishing for him, or no, um, Monday when I was fishing for him, he ate a rivet frog, went down, he started swimming that way, and the line stayed slack. So I went to go pull up, and it was... He'd already swam off with it. He bit right right through it, took it, and oh, was leaving Lord. with it. And I had like a little whip going back. And I was like, oh, well, there goes that one. You were fly fishing. My buddy, looks, <laughs> my buddy looks at me and laughs. And next cast, same happens to him. Wow. It came up, eat it. He went to go set the hook. And he pulls back, and there's no bend in the rod. And whoosh. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Uh, so, so a couple people say this is awesome knowledge. So, um... If there's any more questions, let us know. We're going to move back to Tappahannock real quick because we had a question up above about fishing spots in Tappahannock. We just give a quick brief location. Um, 
What would they like to know specifically? Uh, what, what was the question? The, the question was... Um, is it land... Where to fish at the Tappahannock? In Tappahannock. Where to fish around Tappahannock? Okay, so are we going from boat or are we going from shore? We always got to know that because you're restricted from shore really bad. So you heard that question. We need to know boat or shore um, because that means... Uh, you're you're really difference. restricted. Um, they've got a new pier... And boat ramp that was just finished in January at Hotchkins Creek inside of Tappahannock, um, the south side, after you pass 360 Bridge. Um, you can fish there, and there is a deep channel out in front. Um, just please work with the boaters, and the boaters also please work with the people shore fishing. Um, it's better to communicate with each other than to assume that somebody's going to move or pull a line up or not accidentally let the boat drift or, you know, stuff like that. If, they, if they're coming in you see them coming in and you're fishing there from the shore, just say, hey, buddy, you coming in? Yeah, do you need me to move this? or Is that okay? Or is it going to be in your way? No, 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 it's cool. But if you communicate, more than likely you won't have the issue of, oh, man, your line hit my prop. F U F this all that mm -hmm. stuff. Y'all can communicate, and maybe it'll get done faster, and everybody'll get back to fishing faster. Mm -hmm. You know, we got to help each other out. You can't just be like, you know, a total a hole about the stuff. You just, as long as you communicate, that's the thing with fishermen. As long as we communicate and not assume, you know, you know, we all know what assume means. Sure, sure. You know, so as long as we communicate, we can all get fishing and catching fish. That's the biggest thing. So if we're uh, if we have a boat, so. You'd most likely fish the bridge, and that's pretty much... There is. It all depends on what you're going for, too. You know, if yeah. we're doing selective species of catfish, yep, up until the water hits 65 degrees, and then they're going to push in the deeper holes. Um, that's a cold water area for catfish. Let's okay. just say that way. Summertime, stingray. You'll catch stingray. There's bluefish that come up in there. Um, croaker. So, so pretty much the bridge is like just a good wintertime spot, but once the summertime comes around, it's just anywhere. It switches and... the species. You know okay. what I'm saying? It's like whatever migrates up into there, the croaker, there's five or six good croaker spots on the bridge as long mm -hmm. as they come up in there. Mm -hmm. If they make it to there, then they will be there. That's right. the thing. You know, once the salinity goes back up in the river, these things will start traveling. Mm -hmm. um, so far, we got a projected 45-day, roughly 30 to 45-day um, drought coming up. I want to say the last week of July or second week of August, something like that. Starting then, and it's supposed to last for anywhere from 30 to 45 days. I doubt that'll happen. If it does, salinity is going to go through the roof. Mm -hmm. And then it's going to turn on like gangbusters, probably from Urbana South. Wow. You'll be able to catch a whole bunch of stuff. And that'll be, even in the Potomac, it'll turn on from like Tim's at Coles Point south mm -hmm. it'll that'll be real good um pll will probably be good then annapolis will start getting better up up deal and all that stuff will start getting better all right um so is there any other spots um that you want to talk about i think i don't think we got too much up towards the whitestone bridge uh, other than because no we can go up to the whitestone and um we can talk about the infamous South Wall Ledge right next to the bridge. Everybody knows that let's, spot. Let's uh, let's do that. We'll finish up that. Yeah, let's go down to Whitestone, and we're going to go ahead and... Um, there's tolls. Where are you at? So, Christian asked a question. What's the best water navigation app if you don't have a GPS or a chart plotter? So, I'm going to actually... I, I'll let Mark answer it as well, but I'm going to tell you, I've, I've had one for a really long time. Um, there is actually a pretty cool app. It's uh, it's like a dollar ninety nine, and it's called uh, Topo Chesapeake Bay. Um, it does everything up to about Port Royal. It does not get down into all the little creeks beyond that. Yeah. Um, great. It's much even better than what we're showing you here on screen. What we're showing you here on screen. This is a um, this is home port. This works with my Garmin. It it actually communicates with the Garmin and shows the maps that are in the Garmin. Um, it's it's not near as good as actually as that app that I was just talking about, but um, I'll let uh, Mark answer it as well. He may have a different app for you. Recommend. I have so this app I really like. You have two options of with charts for nine ninety nine a year, or without charts for four ninety nine a year. And it's called Fishing Points, and what it is is you can store your own personal data without taking cards out. All you can drop. Um, where you've caught fish, um, you can do um, measurements, so you can measure what you're going to do, mm -hmm. you can record a, a troll line off of it, you can record that, you can um, save conditions, it has the up to 
up-to-date tides. It has the depth charts. And it, I believe it just now started having weather conditions. But for nine ninety nine a year, yeah, that's not the reason why I have that is is because I get on so many other people's boats where I don't have my fish finder, even though mm -hmm. my fish finder doesn't have a card in it. Mm -hmm. um, so when I go on somebody else's boats... I can still pull up my data and go, yeah, buddy, we can go right here. There's a spot. I caught that right there. And they'll have a picture of what I caught, what the conditions were and all that. It sure, breaks sure. it all down. Um, that would be because you can also pull the maps offline. So say okay. you're in an area where you've got no you cell data. service that was gonna be and question. you know you're going to a dead zone. You can download that map before you get out there so you still have it when you get out there and okay. access it. Yeah. Sure, sure, sure. That's, that was my, I really like that app just because of the accessibility of me being able to know where I've caught fish prior mm -hmm. on somebody else's boat. Yeah, no, I like that. that yeah. Is. So what, what was that one more time? And we will post it in the, um, yes. in the comments below. We'll post it here in a little bit and put a link to that app as well. It's called Fishing Points. Fishing Points. Yeah. We'll get a little. I don't know if you can see that. That's where it's starting to load up. But we ain't got no signal on here, so you ain't gonna get much further than that. <laughs> yeah, but we'll definitely we'll we'll put a um a link in the. We'll, uh, we'll give you all the little secret. Hold yeah. on. I'll give you the little secret shot of. Uh, let me give you all the little secret Let's see if, shot. Yeah, see if Mark tells us all those real secret holes. You're not gonna be able to see them all. <laughs> it's kicking GPS on. So you've got a compass. You've got it all in here. So yeah. I'm literally, I can tell you what direction we're going every time I move the phone, no matter what we do. Okay. So, but it's, it's taking forever to load, but you can't really see. There's a couple spots there. I don't know if you can see it up on there. Yeah, sorry about that, Mark. You're standing. Green here. screen, green screen. You're sitting in my uh, Faraday cage to, um, YouTube studio. Yeah. Uh, it is a giant metal container, so yeah. there's not much signal in here. I don't here. think you can see it because of the green screen. But there's... You can see it. There's a couple. Yeah. There's a couple little points there. Sure, sure. Here, I'll, I'll throw it up on this. Yeah, I don't know if you're gonna be able to see it up that way because of the green screen. See? <laughs> see how it's blacking yeah, it out? Yeah, that's pretty cool. But you can square all all those little squares in there are fishing. Uh, yeah. uh, everything that I've caught in certain locations. Sure. That's my catch data for me privately to take the with map, me. The map screen. I was trying to figure out why it was cutting it out. Yeah, it's because the map screen. Yeah. But that's a good one. So I've got another great app that has probably saved my life three times in the last year and that's the windy app and that is the one that i use for your weather your wind wave prediction mm -hmm. and now they've updated it with a fish pro which will give you a solar lunar uh tide give you all that stuff it's built into there they actually approached me last year um asked if they could advertise it on the group page i said sure no problem i said do you mind if i beta test it and see if it, you know, see if there's any issues, and I can give you feedback and let you know sure. what's going on. And I've been doing that since April. All right. Um, they've taken in some of my comments, changed a couple things, you yeah. know, adapted it a little bit more. They've, they, what I love about this company is, is they have always been striving to make it better. Mm -hmm. That's not a, well, we got there, let's make money. Sure, sure, sure. You know, and it's, I don't know what the cost is, but the basic, um, I did a video for the group, the basic one will still get you the enough information that'll save your life. Okay. You know, it's just, it's, uh, you can put alerts so the wind kicks up, you know, like with Weather Channel app and yeah. stuff, you know, and you're out on the water and you start hearing that thing beeping and you look around and you're like, well, there's nothing. Mm -hmm. And then you look down the app and say, oh, it's coming. Let's get out of yeah. here. You know, it's, it's, it's that stuff, you know, will save your life. I've used that to take my little boat four miles out in the bay in December. Hey, a recommendation <laughs> for them. They should do something like uh, Waze uh, where you can put down and say, oh, this is windy or rough as crap, so everybody knows not to go to that location. They have a chat feature on yeah. there that you can communicate with people, but a lot of people don't use it. They just use it as a data, mm -hmm. conditions for data, you know. Sure, sure. But, yeah, you know, they could do that Waze thing. So, um... <laughs> so when are these going to be uh, released to the App Store? Question. What? That uh, that software that you're talking about. It's there. Oh, it is there. Yep, you can yeah. go in the App Store right now. So go. we'll add a link to that one as well. Yep. It's a Windy app. It's a blue icon. And then there's Fishing Points, which is also a blue icon with an anchor. Okay. I think the Windy app might have a compass inside the... Uh, I'm going to double check. But it's a blue one that has a compass inside of it. Yeah. Oh, yeah yeah, 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 yeah. But let me tell you what. That thing can break it down. So, uh, my smart butt, I've been using this for over a year, all right? And I've been going, they have predetermined locations that you could pop up. Deltaville, <laughs> Buckrow, Hampton, whatever, right? I didn't know I could drop a pin on the exact location and get the same data. 
I did not know. I was like, I so I've been adjusting, you know, like, oh, it's 30, 30 uh, miles yeah, this yeah, way, yeah. so let me adjust for the tide and the wind. You know, I've been doing all that when I could have just dropped the pin right on the area and been like, okay, it's going to be good this whole time. It's going to be all right. Yeah, everything's going to be great. I didn't know that. Okay. I was sl- uh, the slow coach on that one. <laughs> Does that does that Windy app does it have the buoys on it so you can get uh, live buoy data? No, I don't think it has the live buoy data. That's the NOAA Smart Buoy, yeah. um, which is also a great app. Yeah, they re- just redid the one at PLO. I think the one at um, Woodrow Wilson Bridge is back online. But if you want real time, real time data, mm-hmm. that's your that's your app. Yeah. That that that's the okay, well, this app says this, what the conditions might be. Mm-hmm. Then you hit that up and you're like, yeah, it's a little off. Yeah. You know, it's like there's two foot swells, the water temp's five degrees warmer, the salinity is like t- a two points higher or something like that. For sure. sure. And that's another thing you can use too is that they have a real life uh, or up-to-date data of salinity, pH, and all that stuff. So um, You can see where it's at in the river. Yeah, and we're coming up in the bay and all that, and you can also see when we get snow... And they salt and sand the roads when the pH level goes up in the runoff in the river, too. Not a lot of people know that one, either. Yeah, well, I'm <laughs> sure there's tons of it around here. Yeah, that. not a lot of people know that that affects the fishing in the fall, in the um, wintertime for crappie and stuff. When they ice or when they salt and sand the roads and that runoff hits the, the river, the pH level goes through the roof. <laughs> yeah. So there was uh, one topic earlier I told you we were going to come back to. Um do you remember what that was? I have no clue. <laughs> no, I'm just here to answer questions. How about that, Mr. Director? Do you remember what we were supposed to come back to? Uh, no. Sorry about that, there guys. There was one about the free fishing weekend. Yeah, free fishing oh, weekend. That's what it was. Yeah, so I believe it started today and it ends the ninth Sunday. I want to double check for sure, but I want to say it starts today or maybe it's just tomorrow and sat a Sunday. But mm. um, any kid under 16 doesn't need a fishing license anyway, mm. but the adults don't either. So when everybody's out fishing this weekend, please have a little bit more patience. Be- yeah, 7th to 9th. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so when you're out there fishing and there's a bunch of new people out there fishing, please be patient with them because these people are taking their kids out and their family members out and trying to get them hooked on fishing. They don't want. They don't need somebody being impatient and aggressive and aggravated mm-hmm. because it's going to turn them off from fishing. Sure, sure. As simple as that. You know, why instead of hindering, why don't you try to help? Say, oh, you can't. You know, you're casting this way. You're casting that way. Maybe you don't have enough weight here, buddy. I got another two ounce. You can put on there. It'll go straight. It'll stay on the bottom. Let Let's give them one one lure or one type of rig that they should have for a new beginning fishing person. Somebody's never. As you said, you're going to have new people coming out. Tell them one thing they should have. <sighs> one setup. One setup pretty much guaranteed. You know what? They may not be able to catch the cobia, but you know they, they probably can catch I'm going to tell you else. right now, you could probably go to the Walmart and pick up the, I believe it's a competitor rod reel combo. It's like $22. Mm-hmm. You can go right in over into the aisle and grab a pack of four ounce sinkers. You can go over there and grab a six odd circle hook and um, the best leader line on the planet that I've been using full time for the last five years is the OmniFlex dollar seventy five stuff from Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> this is the only leader line I use. I don't buy fluoro. I don't buy none of that stuff. Yeah. I have, I have different weights and spools. Ready to go on the fly, 25, 50, 30, 20, and it's OmniFlex. And I'm going to tell you right now, I've caught almost all my fish, 99% of them, mm-hmm. on the cheapest crap you can buy. And it is a great line where it says 50, it'll pull 80. Yeah, and you know... Uh, and it's really abrasion, abrasion resistant. That's the best part. And you don't need uh, 10,000 yards. You, you know, he's only getting little 150-yard yeah, spools. That's it. So then, you know, like say this is my 50-pound right here. You know, you can get one of these spools of 50-pound... First of all, whatever you do, don't ever trust the line that comes on the reel. When you purchase a reel and you go to use it, you don't know what that line has touched. You don't know if it's been hot, cold, extreme Oils hot, cold. And... You, you have no clue what that line has pulled yeah. up. We appreciate them putting it on there. It'd be better if it came without it because then you could put on line that you could trust. You got to mm-hmm. remember everything you throw out in the water, you need to be able to trust. Mm-hmm. And if you can't trust it, then you're going to get so frustrated because things keep breaking. Mm-hmm. You know, that shouldn't be breaking. But um, that little competitor rod, 20 bucks, pack of sinkers. Um, we won't even go a fish finder rig. We'll go with a three-way swivel and a uh, pack of circle hooks. 
and you can fish up off the bottom. This is a, an extreme example of a three-way swivel. This is a 300. This is your marlin sw <laughs> three-way swivel, but it's the same kind of thing. It's the same kind of thing. Um, you can get a smaller one, but what you'll do is you'll do you'll have this, and I'm a polymer knot junkie. I mm. love polymer knots. I noticed that last week. Um, and if you do it in the right order, you can polymer knot everything except yeah. snelling a hook. <laughs> so what I'll do is you'll do a two-foot leader line down to your sinker off of this, then you'll do a 10-inch leader line out to your hook. Um, that'll keep your baits up off the bottom. If you're not trying to fish for catfish, if you are, you can run a shorter leader line to keep it closer to the bottom. Mm -hmm. But this is this three-way rig, man. You can do. Many there's so different many different fish. modifications that we yeah. we make a small lower three-way rig with a longer leader line out to a J hook, and put a gulp on it for flounder or for croaker or for a spot or for mm -hmm. kingfish. Um, okay. They'll all hit it too, and you can bounce that on a drift. But this is probably one of your better rigs, um, especially if you're fishing in a river because you'll have leaves, mm -hmm. uh, logs. And everything sitting dead on the bottom, creating a space of about a foot up where no fish is going to feed. So if you throw a bottom rig with a fish finder rig on it, which is a slide through rig uh, where the sinker stays but the line pulls through, you will literally put it in the brush. And it'd be like somebody trying to um, find a basketball in a field of wheat <laughs> when it's laying down on the bottom. You're not going to be able to see it, smell it nothing right. so if you can if you know that there's a lot of debris or logs around you you can adjust the height on this we fished them 10 feet off the bottom before wow you know you can do it that way or you know even with the three-way rigs you can go on a drift and uh drop it let it touch bottom three cranks up and leave it in a rod holder and just drift down the river and something will you know bite it eventually because it'll look like a, a bait just flowing down the river mm -hmm. not attached to the bottom some of the bigger fish know when baits are attached to the bottom they're fighting a current, and they see something sitting still. They know better than, that's a little fishy. That's a, you know, that's a little, you know, that thing sits still, and I'm over here working my butt off. So, yeah. you know, it's stuff like that. But then you can go on a drift, and it goes, go by them with no tension, and it'll hit it. Okay. You know, there's just, there's a bunch of different ways to do the three-way rig. Well, one one last question before we end for the night, um, because we, I, somehow I may have sidetracked you. We were heading towards the Whitestone Bridge to talk about the oh, Whitestone, yeah. Whitestone Bridge, and someone brought up a question and said, where to fish at Whitestone? So, all right, coming into Whitestone, let me zoom out just a hair. So the north side, the very top side of it, yeah, there you go. um, You've got a ledge that runs through there, and you can see it on the depth chart right here. You see how it comes in, and there's usually ships right here, and a lot of people like to fish ships for croaker and stuff. It's out of the main current slightly. It's been some good weak fish there. Yeah, before. good good weak fish. Um, sometimes the specks will stack up there on the shallow side of that. Um, but right here, this ledge is a great rockfish troll spot. Not only that... My only catfish I've ever caught up here... It's been right there on that ledge. Right there on that ledge, yeah. yeah. It's an ambush spot. So, you know, rockfish are ambush predators. The catfish have changed from scavengers to predators, mm -hmm. um, and that's in direct effect of uh, competing, mm -hmm. competition. So, but I literally lost one over 50 pounds. Oh, by the old cable marker that's there. Yeah, buddy. So we were trolling for six hours, and the current was coming in, and we'd come swooping around and hit right through here, and somebody had an eel pot right here. Mm. So I looked back behind the boat to see if uh, we were going to snag the eel pot because we were like six feet away from it. And that thing said, boop, boop, zzz, started running. <laughs> but the line in the only bait caster I have, I won in a, a veterans catfish tournament. Um, the line had gotten flipped from with catfish you pull up and reel down and when you do that on a on a bait caster or conventional reel yeah, it, it makes backlash. humps it makes yeah. a hump and that hump what happens is that line got flipped and spun and pinched between the the reel wall the spool wall and the line mm. and locked up while it was running <laughs> and it broke this 50 pound mono and took the lure mm-hmm um, as I was trying to turn the boat to go chase them down. Yeah, and a lot of people, if you don't live down here, right, right where you see the, the light blue section there, yeah, uh, that is a huge oyster bed down there as yep. well. Yep, that is a great spot right there. You can come out. There's a little beach right there at the bottom of... Um, Gray's Point. There, well, you have Gray's Point here, but yeah. you've actually got... That's a public beach, yep, that you that's, can actually... I launched my boat right at that yeah. public beach, and we'll go straight out Kayak. right here. Kayaks or hand Yeah, kayaks, soft launch. Yeah. You gotta remember, I got a boat that folds up to the size of a surfboard. <laughs> so, and we take it everywhere from the bay. The only place it hasn't touched yet is the ocean, and it'll touch that this year. Um, 
it, we should have gone when, when we went in Ocean City in April, but it fogged, dude, the worst fog I've ever seen rolled in at 8 o'clock in the morning stayed till midnight. Christian just got the uh, premium version of Fishing Point and says it looks awesome. It is. It's a great, I'm telling you, man, it's such a great app because the versatility of you being able to have your spots with you at all times and not cost an arm and legs and the depth charts. That's just a key fact right there because, you know, you can get free information online all day, but when you're in a boat, you can't do nothing about it, you know? And if you got no signal, you're really screwed. So you have to download them um, in, in the offline mode. Um, so David asked the question, best, best bait, best live bait, live what? eels or spot for Cobia? What's best? Ooh. <laughs> I'm going to go with Threadfin. The big, 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 uh, thread fin that you can jig out down there on a sabiki. Um, so we tried croaker last year. We went halves on, you know, fresh half croaker and we burn up stingrays all day long. Cow nose rays all day long. I, I think any cut bait, you're going to really pull in the rays. That's all how you fish it too. Yeah. So we figured out running a fish finder rig dead flat on the bottom of the sand. You're going to scoop rays up all day long. Yeah. You will literally have, it's like 10 to one, 10 rays, one cobia. Mm -hmm. So we switched up and went to that three-way rig this year, and I started going knee-high off the bottom, one ray to three cobias. So we switched it up. And once we pulled it up off the bottom a little bit, which people will like to do with a float, yeah. but I like to do it on three-way and a fast current because if you got a float and a fast current, you got to attach a sinker to it. They're asking, what's threadfin heron? Threadfin is a form of bait fish. Um, People like to argue with it doesn't get bigger than four or five inches, but we've seen them, and I've got live videos from Buckrow Pier that they're this big. Mm -hmm. um, and really, a live bunker or menhaden is probably the bee's knees out there because yeah. it's so hard for people to throw out a live bunker. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people will chum with it, and then they'll put out chunks, and then, you know, you got to fend off the rays again. Yeah. But eels, I don't catch nothing on eels. So uh, I gave up on eels. Yeah. I get yeah, it. and and I'm gonna put my my two cents on the eels is that um, from my experience, it's the eels do better when the water is a little warmer than when the water is colder. That's what I was thinking too. Is you know once the water temp hits about 80 degrees, that's when they really start kicking yeah. on. Um, the real trick that I've heard and seen a couple times was running a chum bag full of bunker off the bow where your anchor is at, so that the chum bag scopes back to the bottom up underneath the transom and when it sits there you drop an eel straight down next to it so when the cobia comes up smelling the bunker and sees that it's not moving they see the eel moving and instantly go to the eel but the bunker is what got them there the eel is what gets them hooked supposedly mm -hmm. that's what i heard you know but sharks will eat the meals too yeah you know bull bull sharks will get them but back to the regular baits is Croaker will work, so we switch from uh, halves, fresh halves, get burned up. So we're like, hey, let's put a live one out. Maybe it'll, no, <laughs> biggest cow nose ray of the day was like 60 pounds on a whole live croaker that was this big. <laughs> Ate the whole thing. So, you know, but thread fin or bunker, but we also, you get to know it on the wrap. You get, you're allowed to keep hickory shad on the wrap. We stacked over 305 different freezers so that we could use them all for cobia. Mm. Uh, the biggest fit, biggest Kobe I lost last year was over 60 pounds on a hickory shad head. <laughs> and I got to see him because as soon as he bit it and I put tension on him, he went airborne and then sh went in the water, shook his head twice, and that was it. Game over. He was gone. And I had a pastor with me that could <laughs> vouch for that one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everyone. Any questions? Uh, so we're going to finish up for the night. Um, we've been on about an hour and a half now. Um, we have decided based on feedback and, <laughs> and the amount of conversation. I made it down two questions on my list um, that we're going to turn this into a series. Um, probably sometimes we'll be fishing and talking, yeah. um, you know, and sometimes we'll be doing this on a rainy Friday night. So <laughs> Just like today. We know everybody's inside gearing up and game planning for tomorrow. <laughs> and if you're going fishing tomorrow, that's exactly what you should be doing. Thanks, you, David. Your, hey, your, your prep work. Um, fishing starts, so say you're going out 7 o'clock next morning, that day starts probably 7 o'clock this morning. And the reason why is because of prep time. You can't just, you know, you can say, hey, I'm going to grab some hooks in line, and I'm just going to go out, and I'm going to sit here. You can do that. But if you're really trying to target bigger fish, try to target certain fish, try to target cetacean fish, you really got to plan. I check the weather two, 300 times a day. No, no BS. And I go through multiple sources to see. I've got a trip tomorrow. I've got a snakehead trip tomorrow morning. I had a snakehead trip yesterday. Um, Sunday looks wet all day, but I'm going to try to slide something in the afternoon. 
you know, and you have to learn how to work around it. Uh, we do fish in the rain. I prefer not to in the summertime because that constitutes lightning and thunder. You know, and those are those little things. Yesterday we had zero percent rain at like one o'clock, and we're like, yeah, let's fish for a little bit more. And I started noticing temperature drop two, three degrees. The wind started kicking up, but there's not a cloud in the sky. I was like, all right, buddy, we'll work this little area and we'll work on the way back. So we worked on the way back. By the time we got back to the boat ramp, finished the last little fishing within the boat ramp, got the the boat in the truck and ratchet strapped it down. As soon as the last click, it started pouring. <laughs> you know, and so you just never know. But it's once you've been out in the water long enough, you start seeing the signs. You yeah, know. no, definitely. We dodged the water spout yeah. the other day. Yeah, I mean, we we spent we, in... we missed four storms yeah. in a water spout. And didn't get wet at all. Matter of fact, we never even saw over a foot wave the entire day. The whole ta- the whole day, because we know how to play that duck and cover game. Yeah. That's that will save your life every day, all day. If you can know, <laughs> we did go ninety two miles, but <laughs> yeah, we did go ninety two miles and saw everything. Saw three hundred yeah. pods of bait. We should have switched. I was thinking about we should have switched up to. I watch. I watch one of Mark's lunker lures bounce off the head of a cobia. I mean, it practically made a sound loud enough yeah. that you could hear it. Yeah, you, you, you know. it's you know, we did everything we could that day. It was just mm-hmm. I. I told you that morning. I said between yeah. the pressure from the storm, and the amount and of slow. pressure from the people fishing the tournaments and first day of Kobe season it was going to be a real tough day yeah. but I was thinking after the fact all those pods of bait were getting worked by Max dude yeah. we should have switched to Max yeah we well, I, yeah. My, so my my buddy um, that lives one creek over he went out the following day and they got 37 Max. I, I knew that it was just Max crashing yeah. and we just didn't have a I, yeah. I didn't do any speed retrieving with a uh I I, I, I did once, you know, I was getting a few bumps here and there, but yeah, I was pretty beat after uh, 13 hours. By the way, guys, 13 hours. That's there. average day. Yeah, that's, a, that's an average day, buddy. <laughs> yeah, it was 13 hours in the bay, you know. So yep. you know, and we played miles. and we avoided everything, dude. It was so flat. I told yeah. him, I told him at like noon because it was so crappy in the morning. I was like, man, watch it's gonna lay flat. It's gonna yeah. lay so nice and flat, and then it looked like we were fishing in a lake. <laughs> All right, everybody. Well. This is Backyard DIY Jim Jim signing out. I appreciate everybody's comments. Um, we'll send something back out. I think we're going to turn this into a series. So uh, any last-minute comments you got there? No, nope, just treat everybody with respect when you're fishing. Try to help. That's all it is, man. You, you're out there to have fun. And if you know something that somebody else does it and you see that you might be able to help them to have a little bit more fun of a day, a better day catching fish or a little kid catching a fish, you know, little kids catching fish always gets me, you know, <laughs> especially when you get them on the little Barbie rides. But if you can help somebody out, I helped the little kid guy get, yeah. a, get a shad on one of those little 24-inch rods, That's hickory awesome. shad. But if you can help somebody out and help them get into more fish, or at least just offer, you know what I'm saying? Like, oh, man, I see you're having problems, you know, I usually do it this way, do you need any help? Or, hey, buddy, if you run this rig this way, just a little bit different, you're going to catch more fish, mm-hmm. stuff like that. And please don't. I understand and appreciate the time and effort you put into a hole, into a spot. I understand that. This is a tidal river. We don't need to fight over spots. The fish move in and out. The populations, everything's holding fine other than striped bass, which has been um, taken care of for at, at this point in time. The population's good. Everything's fine. We don't need to fight over spots, or nor do we need to withhold information because it benefits just you and not everybody else. That's the only thing I don't appreciate that some people do. 99.9% of them actually will share everything, even the charter captains. Mm -hmm. That's what really gets me is how many charter captains will you know will tell you where the spots are hot in lieu of them possibly losing money because someone will go there and catch that fish. Right, right. Not a lot, but on this page they do because they all understand that we are trying to help each other. Sure, sure. You know, with the difficult time we had last year with all the floods and the fresh water, it was a smorgasbord of where what when how all year long Mm -hmm. um and it was really a trying time for everybody in in the whole fishing community for that for last year but this year it started off real good shad run was great um that's one of the funnest times man and those those shad are by by far if you get them eight ten pounds like they get out in the ocean Mm -hmm. you wouldn't be able to land them there's no way (laughs) there's no way tarpon are starting to roll up in here too yeah they just caught them off avalon pier all right, you heard it. It's Mark. He's signing out with me. Uh, yep, again, look. again, we'll be back. Shoot more questions if you have it. Yep, um, you can always hit us up at Rappahannock River Fishing Report through Facebook or Fish the Rap, hashtag Fish the Rap, R-A-P-P, on Instagram. 
Um, feel free if you have any questions to message me, hit me up. I always try to answer. If I'm a little slow, I'm sorry. I might be fishing or answering other questions. Um, but feel free to hit me up. If I've got the knowledge, I'll give it to you. And if I don't, I might be able to find the person that can give it to you. All right. Thank you.